Greetings, everyone, and thanks a lot for joining us on yet another episode of the Weekly Beats uh, by Mansa. And uh, we're talking uh, the global economy today. We're looking at what's happening globally in terms of the Ukraine-Russia war warnings uh, with the recession, but also we'll dive deep into the AFCFTA uh, with a very special guest we have today, Dennis Matanda, who is also the chief executive of Morgan Powell Stanley. Dennis, thanks a lot for joining us and a uh, good day. Where are you joining us for? I am um, I'm about 10 miles outside Princeton, New Jersey. And uh, thank you so much for having me. Maggie, we've had so many conversations about this offline. I'm so glad that we are bringing this home finally. <laughs> and congratulations on all the successes that Mansa has had in the past year. Thank you very much. I feel like this is going to be another fight. But you know, I'm so always very excited to learn from you, especially because you're mm -hmm. all, over, all over the world. We just had a chat about uh, you explaining to me how South Sudan could actually be a very good opportunity for a lot of investors. And I was like, who, mm -hmm. who goes mm -hmm. to South mm -hmm. Sudan? And he spent like five minutes giving me reasons as to why uh, you would actually do business in South Sudan, but you know, which is um, not so often that you hear such countries put across and obviously this is what you do with your company as well but you know what we're seeing is a lot of warnings against um what is to happen uh in terms of uh economies crashing down not really but uh there is uh, some sense of a lot of uh companies like yours or a lot of uh, investment firms coming up so you really need to be cautious in the next couple of uh, months or the coming year because we don't know what is really going to happen what can you, you know what's us? very interesting what's very interesting uh, about the coming recession the coming recession is going to be very different uh, than any other recession. Uh, you know, people always say there's always a global recession every 10 years. This recession is going to be very close in tandem with the two year, three year slowdown that we had due to COVID. So the next recession is a result of the follow up on the challenges that we had with COVID, which is basically the the, the, the flu that you get after a, a major illness, but it's going to be short, but very bloody. And when I say this, it's probably, and I'm taking, I'm, I'm exaggerating from what The Economist uh, has been predicting, you know, The Economist has been uh, uh, sending out a, a really, really good comprehensive insight but it comes from the american side of things in in, in very simple terms if there is a recession uh, what's probably going to happen is the republicans are going to take over the house and the senate which means they are not going to allow joe biden to do anything that's going to fix the global economy because anything that gives joe biden a success is going to be something the republicans do not want um what's also very interesting about that is if we expand it mm. to the rest of the world if you see what's happening yeah i think in that's Europe, what i was gonna say where, yeah where so I'm, I'm coming yeah, yeah. yeah so let's come let's start with developing countries in uh in uh eastern europe what's very interesting is countries like bulgaria countries like poland um a country like hungary those countries that were associated with uh the soviet union the former soviet union and russia what russia has done is has gone and said oh you guys are you know uh uh, trying to be part of the team that sanctions us. Well, we are going to cut off whatever it is. They cut off uh, resources to Bulgaria. What instantly happened is the global supply chain went into effect people like Bulgaria started to source uh, uh, things that they could get uh, elsewhere. Do not be yeah. surprised if Saudi Arabia pumps up or ramps up its, um, its uh, oil production to compensate for Russia. Let's now talk about developing countries like India and uh, China. China is still a developing country, although it is still the world's uh, largest, second largest economy. If you look at a country like Russia, 30% of Russia's foreign um, foreign deposits are in Remnimbi. So there is a very strong relationship between China, India, providing uh, oil and gas for those regions. But what we have is something that 
would um, appeal to somebody like you who is sitting in Dakar right now. The president of Senegal went and met uh, president of Russia, Putin. And, you know, there has I'm been really a very... I'm really glad you're touching on this because, you know, we yes. just covered it as a story, but we did not yeah. get gist. Yeah. So, so if, mm -hmm. you, if you see what's really funny about that, to have a, a, an African president come out and say, you know, he got reassurances from the president of Russia on uh, some of the aspects on wheat. What that tells you is that the president of Russia is very anxious about the ramifications of what is happening right now. Many of these things that the Russian president uh, did, I can bet you he didn't expect the world to react in the way it has. He thought that it was going to be another 2014 or 2014 thing of going okay. take Crimea. Crimea was huge and then, you know, get away with all sorts of things. What you have now is a real reaction. And when I say real reaction, he is trying to come out and be the savior again. Mm. of saying you know what you african countries like a country like uh tanzania does almost 85 percent of its wheat uh imports uh from from russia and uh, you have countries That's like crazy. ethiopia yes it is absolutely crazy the number of african countries that depend on russia for their wheat is uh is is is, is, is huge what's very interesting about that is that mm. senegal and during a very difficult time like this, Senegal is considered an American ally. What Senegal has done is basically done the Pan-African movement and the non-aligned movement uh, strategy that they had <laughs> during the Cold War, which is like, listen, we are not going to be a friend of the West or the East. Well, we need we to feed to our people at the end. Yeah, we have to feed know? our people. But what this does, it reeks of desperacy. And in my opinion, the reason why Senegal is very important is that Senegal consumes a lot of bread. And Senegal is, is quite uh, yeah, Senegal is yeah. quite unique. Uh, many of these uh, francophone countries consume a significant a amount of bread. For me, yeah, what really sucks. Um, I'm sorry to use a non-academic word like sucks, but what really hurts me is that African countries have not necessarily diversified their um, capacity to import uh, wheat. Let me give you a simple example. There is a lot of red wheat that comes out of Ohio. They have so much heat, so much wheat that they are willing to send this wheat into <laughs> African countries. There is so much wheat but sitting is, in the that, United doesn't States. It, doesn't it bother you that how come we do not actually have wheat? Like when I see the numbers of saying we import this amount of amount of wheat, I have actually gone into uh, studies to understand. How come we import such a huge amount of weight from as far as Russia, as far as Ukraine? It's a combination of two things, in my opinion. It's called the iron law of oligarchy. And, and what I'm saying is that there are people who have been supplying the market for a very, very long time. And, it's and they have made quite a bit of money. And so they have perfected the value chains and they're able to do this better and better. And they get used to the market doing things in a particular way. And so if you even told somebody that we have the capacity to get American wheat, they're thinking, what? What, who wants to do that? Because people cannot think about it. They have been used to doing things in a particular way. If you say the same thing to the Americans, are thinking, send our wheat to Africa. I mean, you know, so it, 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 it is a balance of things. It is the cycle of trade. But that cycle of trade is based on the iron law of oligarchy. There are people who are making lots and lots of money right now with the status quo. And now, because like... of the challenges with mm -hmm. Russia, they're suddenly starting to react. So I'm just saying that within these major challenges, you also have significant opportunities. You have opportunities in the United States, you have opportunities in Africa, to basically negotiate with Russia because Russia is not in a position of strength. So it no, is that trying. Means, it's trying to get Please allies. Now that brings mm -hmm. me to the to our next conversation, which is the AFCFTA. And uh, I think earlier on you are explaining and you're like, um, what hurts is our economies haven't been able to diversify 
you know, and move away or even, in, you know, let's specify in terms of this importation of wheat. Um, ideally, um, and, and I might sound radical, Dennis, but in times like these, I feel like this is when blocks like the AFCFTA thrive because there is now a chance to turn and do things differently. I could be wrong. Uh, but uh, again, you've been working with the AFCFTA for so long. Uh, with what is happening and the global supply chains, where are we? Is so there the an big challenge for the trading uh, agreement to actually work? For example, if Senegal is is now negotiating with Russia, are we negotiating as Senegal or as as the FCFTA countries that actually signed? If we are having um, uh, Russian oil sanctioned and we have our oil back in Africa and all these countries discovering oil, uh, the likes of Uganda, Kenya and every other country, including Senegal, that have oil, are we negotiating as individual countries or are we going to go as um, a block, the FCFTA? I mean, there's one big advantage are we here, missing an a opportunity huge here? advantage. Mm. Um, His Excellency Makisal also met the Russian president as mm. the chairperson or the chief executive of the African Union. Now, mm. that in its own way is huge because what you have is somebody who is speaking for all 55 African countries. Now, mm. the challenge about that is that we cannot run away from the reality that the private sector drives trade, the private sector drives business. Now, uh, yes, China has been able to be very successful with its public uh, government-driven model of the government infusing funds into entities that then generate business. Africa mm -hmm. has not necessarily done that with its public uh, finances. It still has an opportunity to do that, um, mm -hmm. leveraging development finance institutions like the African mm -hmm. Bank, the Trade and Development Bank, and the other 80, 79 development finance institutions that festoon the African continent. The challenge that you have right now on the AFCFTA mm -hmm. starts with something that is, you're going to be surprised. Let me talk about South Sudan. South Sudan sits on such a prime day, real estate. South Sudan is coming in here. Me, yes, I'm talking about South Sudan because mm. of a project called Lapset. There mm. is a road that is being developed from Lamu all the way into Ethiopia, Uganda, whatever, and then into South Sudan. And then from mm -hmm. South Sudan, you go all the way to West Africa. The point is that until such projects have seen the time of day, until such projects are getting such a cadence that they are building night and day, the AFCFTA cannot succeed as well as it should. In fact, it will things will keep on being at the level of Uganda doing more business with Europe than with Nigeria. Uganda doing more business with Europe than with Angola. Uganda doing more business with Europe than Rwanda, Burundi, and uh, all that. What's very interesting is that if you go into Juba and uh, other parts of South Sudan, you will find that South Sudan has been developed by fellow African countries. The biggest banks are Kenyan. You have Equity Bank. You have KCB huge. The telephone networks are all African. MTN and uh, Zain and um, Airtel, all those people are doing business in the region. If you talk about apples, um, mangoes, bananas, rice, those things come from either Uganda or Kenya. The drivers, the professional coterie is from the region. What you have as a challenge is you need significant investments. And what you then have as another challenge is that there's what they call dry powder. You have over $700 billion of private equity and venture capital funds waiting in the United States, not getting into Africa. The point is that if you want to resolve the AFCFTA prob problems, you need to have over a hundred billion dollars invested into infrastructure every single year. What's also very interesting about African infrastructure is that it pays. In fact, investing in African infrastructure is more secure than investing in America because what you have in Africa is sovereign guarantees. Even if you cannot get a sovereign guarantee from a country like South Sudan because it's yeah. um 
its rating is lower, what you have mm -hmm. is financial institutions like the African Bank, you have uh, TDB, you have the AFDB. Each of these is an investment grade institution. And those you know, things really mm -hmm. matter. Mm, but you Please know, Dennis, when, you, when you're talking about investment and you know having the private sector at the forefront of the AFCFG, I think this is what has been done for quite some years. I mean, nope. you're aware of the, the not at all. Champion. Not at all. Not at yeah, all. Of course, to a small scale, the, uh, and hypothetically speaking, as somebody who doesn't want to come out to bash anybody, we've seen organizations yeah. like the Afro Champions that really have tried to, you know, move along and, and all of this. But of, obviously, mm -hmm. from the, the beginning of the AFCFTA, there were always questions around, can this really be pulled off um, uh, with what we've seen with, with regional integration that hasn't really worked? How are you going to integrate the entire continent? What is that, you know, of course, there's that part of the infrastructure, but also it comes down to the willingness. Uh, just the other day, a friend of mine told me she had to wait for her visa for three months to travel to Senegal from South Africa. So you've moved from open up borders to wait for three months visa to come to Senegal. I still receive a three weeks visa to go to South Africa, which is ridiculous. And I have to pay $90. Uh, obviously, it's the most expensive, shortest visa I ever get my entire, you know, life. But it's how, it's what it is, like we say. So ideally, I, I feel like there is a big elephant in the room with the FCFT that we are not addressing. And we're looking at big projects like infrastructure that will need massive investment. But, but let's agree on something. Startups, you know? Let's agree small on something. Mm. What is the AFCFTA? The AFCFTA is broken into two major aspects. There is the mm. political side and there's the technical side. But let's talk about the political side side for yeah. starters the political side was an agreement amongst mm. all the other countries if you go back to 2017 2018 when the first um aspects or the first attributes of the afcfta were signed there was a discussion about open skies african skies mm. you know allowing mm. that to happen there was even a question around visas and uh business what you have is the continued challenges of African countries doing and producing the same products and services. A country like Malawi still produces maize, just like Zambia, just like um, Zimbabwe, they still produce the same products and services. So it means that economically speaking, you're going to have people in Malawi that are anxious about maybe better quality products coming in from Tanzania, maybe better quality products that are coming in from uh, um, Zimbabwe or even South Africa. Mm. That's a normal progression. If you go mm. back to the European Coal and Steel Society just after the mm -hmm. Second World War, countries like the United Kingdom and uh, Germany, Germany wasn't really uh, big yet, but countries that were much smaller were really anxious about about those guys up on more experience. But what happens is that the market has to drive aspects. But that is the political side. And if you also go back to the people that signed the, the AFCFTA agreement, all 44 cut signed the AFCFTA. There are 44 that signed in 2018. Not all 44 signed the protocol on free movement of people. Not all signed the protocol on skies. But if you have these things at their ideal, you will see that they're going to be much better. In fact, by 2035, I can tell you that if everything goes the way it is supposed to grow, there is a very big chance that the number of people who are driven out of poverty is up to 50 million and above. Now let's come to the technical side. The AFCFTA has only finished phase one which is mm. trading goods, which began uh, January 1st, uh, 2021. There is an even bigger aspect here, which is the trading services. And if you look at mm -hmm. most African economies, most African economies are now they have bigger components. Uh, their GDPs uh, have an increasing amount of services. Mm. The AFCFTA is going to be able to do many things like that. And there, the, the challenge that you have is that until the private sector stakes its ground and does what it has done under the East African community. I just saw the report card of the East African community uh, secretary general. He got some very good marks because regional integration is real. Regional integration is not just the AFCFTA. It's the eight building block wrecks of 
the African Union. It is ECOWAS. ECOWAS is at the epitome of regional integration. It is a customs union. And ECOWAS is also very interesting because they collect a percentage to fund the infrastructure of ECOWAS. The big challenge here is more on the financial side. The ECOWAS Bank is not an investment grade institution. It is less than $1 billion in capitalization. From mm. that perspective, the ECOWAS Bank should be doing what Afrexim Bank is also doing. ECOWAS Bank should be at least $20 billion. The Trade and Development Bank should be at least $20 billion. If you have five financial institutions Institution, that are yeah. at the 20 billion dollar level they can fund the afcfta let's now talk about the last part and why the afcfta forms a very very strategic part of uh, the world i want to bring it back to the united states the United yeah. States for a very long time has depended on the African Growth and Opportunities Act as its most, uh, you know, engaged relationship with the continent. Mm. That's great. But there's only 30 to 40 beneficiaries at any one time. The AFCFTA has been signed by 54 countries. The mm. only country that hasn't signed is Eritrea. And Eritrea is going to benefit. After all, Ethiopian Airlines flies from Addis to, you know, um, Asmara. The That's point not. is that there are too many opportunities to be ignored. If Lapset comes from Lamu to Mombasa to Nairobi to Addis Ababa to Juba, and then there is an opportunity to take that road to the Democratic Republic of Congo through Central African Republic to West Africa. That is a viable thing, but it really comes down to marketing. Until you get these packages together and show the world that there are viable ways to fund these infrastructure things, that road from Cairo to Cape Town doesn't have to be a road. The Blue Nile between Juba and Egypt is navigable both ways mm -hmm. on the road. I'm just basically saying that the significant opportunities that Africa has have not been packaged. It is why you have people like uh, President Sal going to speak to Russia because they have not really seen the various opportunities around. I think for me, what you have in Africa is not challenges, it's strategic issues. I think wow. that if you just sat down and focused on the strategic issues and found, okay, fine, we need to find strategic partners who can actually sell Africa's infrastructure because it's more secure than American infrastructure because you have sovereign guarantees, which means you'll be paid. From that perspective, that is the marketing we're talking about. The AFCFTA I is a solid, solid thing. I, I mean, it's really good to see that there's still hope. Uh, obviously, I'm one of the people that, uh, and you know how passionate I was about it. I still have a little mm -hmm. doubt. You still are. That. Uh, now that I've listened to you a little bit, <laughs> but then it's uh, the, we are literally being strained by time here. So I'm always happy to have you, and at least you give us a little bit of that confidence with the FCFT. And we obviously will keep positive, but it's a very long shot to uh, mm -hmm, to take. Mm -hmm. And we're still hoping that, you know, I mean, right now, if you ask any trader, what's up with the FCFT, they'll be like, ah, that thing still exists. So, but also, I guess we need to be. That means more. the trader is too small. If the trader <laughs> says that, it means they're too small. That Does that really make sense? They're trader. too small. They're too small. But then, but then, but then think about it. We have the, the, the biggest, uh, the biggest traders we have are the informal traders. Aren't they the smallest traders? So who, who, who are we doing it for if we're not doing it for these traders? That's I, I, I can tell you that if I was to respond to you about the AFCFTA, what's interesting is that if you look at the cross-border trade between um, Liberia and, uh, for example, uh, Guinea, Guinea Conakry, or if you look at trade between Senegal and its neighbor, the Gambia, the, Gambia. the cross-border trade is happening. That trade is already happening. It is what they call informal cross-border trade. It is doing so much business, and I'm so happy that it's helping the women. Women are doing the trade. All we have to do is to facilitate that system even better. 
What we need to do is to make sure that ECOWAS works, the EAC works, SADAC works, and then the, e the, 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 the AFCFTA will work. So we're looking at it many, many years away because we're still... No, by 20... Is, uh, the the last thing I'll say, before, be, before you go, before you go, let me make the point. In 2018, did anybody expect that we would be here right now with the world's largest, largest... So we're just having the area. world's largest in words. I mean... It is not in words, it's in reality. In terms of movement of people, of what? Think about it, Dennis. How are you going to trade if you can't even cross the border? I tend to believe in tipping points. I tend mm. to believe in a crescendo. There has been a wave building, a wave building. I will not be surprised if in 2023, when the protocol in services has been signed, if you see what Secretary General Wamkele is doing, he's inundated. What that does is opportunities. Expand that secretariat and then look and see at the way the Trade Commissioner of the African Union's portfolio has expanded. It has expanded to economics. What that means, it's Africa's civil service is finally getting the importance of strategy, issues and selling. And that for me is exciting. We will keep being optimistic. Dennis, thanks a lot for joining us, uh, Chief Executive of Morgan Power Stanley. And uh, that's what we had for you on today's weekly beat. We've gone over time, Dennis, but uh, it's always a pleasure <laughs> to have uh, your insight. Uh, don't forget to check out our website, www.mansomedia.africa. Sign up for our weekly newsletter, The Third Opinion, coming out every Friday morning. And check out all our social pages. We have so much content. And as we say, we are helping you understand Africa and uh, your gateway into the markets by through storytelling. We hope you love the content and here's to peace and profits. Have a lovely week.